SpaceX's Starship Tower is taking a vacation to Starbase. Meanwhile, the Falcon 9 crew access structure has finally been completed. And, at last, we've spotted Blue Origin's New Glenn rocket in the wild. Yes, a New Glenn! But, if you think that's all we have, sit back and fasten your seatbelt, because there's a lot more to cover on this Cape Flyover. As usual with our Cape Flyovers, it's not just going to be me on camera. We have Adrian going over all of the exciting stuff we've spotted from Blue Origin, and Alex is also going to be covering the latest developments at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility. So, without further ado, let's get over to Alex and see what's up with the movements at Roberts Road. You may remember from our most recent Starbase flyover that we mentioned a new set of columns and other sort of Starship launch tower pieces had arrived there at SpaceX's South Texas facility. We theorized that this may have come from KSE and even used satellite images from Umber Space provided by our friend Harry Stranger to see that these columns had disappeared from Roberts Road. In fact, if we look around the site where these tower sections were being built, the place just looks so much more clean compared to our last Cape flyover. And not just these columns have disappeared, but also the smaller beams and connectors for these beams, you know, the whole thing basically. The only major remaining piece here is this beam right behind this tower section, which is part of the roof section of the launch tower. This is the diagonal beam on the topmost section of the tower that then holds the pulley system for the chopstick carriage system. There's a lot of discussion on whether these sections were moved to Starbase for either a new tower or just to extend the current one. So basically some sort of like team extension versus team new tower kind of thing. Fight. I'm a new tower by the way. And while this tower section's abandoning the site is kind of a surprise, it was not a surprise to see that the last tower section for the Space Launch Complex 40's crew access tower is also gone. In their stead, SpaceX has now brought these two white tanks which were previously at Launch Complex 39A and even before that you can already imagine where they were, yep, Starbase. I tell you, these two places have quite a history of, you know, sending hardware back and forth. If you remember from our last flyover, we talked about SpaceX's plans to expand its footprint here at Roberts Road. This expansion will occur to the north and take about 100 acres of land, or about 400,000 square meters for those that, you know, prefer metric like me. With this expansion, SpaceX will be able to build new facilities and new buildings, New grading plans have been released for that project since our last flyover, which outlined the places where the company plans to build things like retention ponds, elevated land, and so on. This new location is set to be massive and could hopefully hold a future production facility for Starship here at the Cape. I'm sure the editor is currently showing some kind of mock-up of what it will look like. Not to scale. <laughs> but before any of that happens though, we shall see that land area being cleared and worked on, and once that happens, you can bet we'll be here to cover it all. At the Hangar X2 building here at Roberts Road, we can see some work ongoing on the west side of the facility. This work may be to install more utilities for all the work going on inside, which is mainly processing all the many Starlink satellites for flight on Falcon 9. And as a bonus from this flight, we also got to see a booster parked outside of Hangar X after having been transported from Port Canaveral. This booster in particular will be beaten 69 after its 11th flight, having supported the Starlink Group 628 mission just a couple of weeks ago. But this was not the only nice booster we've seen around the Cape during this flyover. I'm sure Adrian will have lots to talk about another much larger booster that we're seeing in the wild. Blue Origin's Exploration Park campus continues to be a hive of activity at both the southern and northern ends of the facility. Firstly, in our last flyover we noted that there were parts for a tent lying between the warehouse and the Reef Pathfinder building. That tent has now been assembled, but what is it used for? That remains to be known. Next door, the Reef Pathfinder building looks much more complete on the outside. As a reminder, the Reef Pathfinder building seems to be associated with the early development of Blue Origin's Orbital Reef Space Station. Heading up toward the main manufacturing building, there's some road widening taking place. While this doesn't seem all that interesting on its own, there is more to it. In 2022, Blue Origin submitted plans for a 100,000 square foot building, referred to as the CA building, to be constructed in this area. However, new permitting documents for the current road widening state that the CA building will no longer be built, but the remaining 8 acres of improvements are still under planning. Well, you saw the intro and Alex already hinted at it. You know what's coming, so let's get into it. 
Our much-loved flyover team was lucky enough to capture a New Glenn first stage tank section just as it was rolling into the manufacturing building through the northern entrance. In the New Glenn payload user guide from 2018, this section of the rocket was referred to as first stage mid-module, a section which contains both the oxygen and liquid natural gas tanks for the first stage. But I can tell you, this section is nothing mid. This is the most complete first stage we have seen yet. Not only is it fully decorated with a paint job and decals, but you can see actual plumbing on the aft end of the tank section. These connections will supply LNG and locks to the seven BE4 engines of New Glenn. You can see how the connections for the liquid oxygen are directly mounted on the dome, while the LNG connections are located on a manifold that sticks out of the center of the dome. In addition to this, it looks like we can see the attachment points for the large strakes on the aft end of the tank section. These arrow surfaces will help provide the first stage with enhanced cross-range capabilities during re-entry. As our team was flying back south, they managed to capture the first stage again, just before it was completely inside of the factory. This provided us with a good look at the forward dome of the boosted tank section that's gonna be for the liquefied natural gas, or basically the methane tank of New Glenn. This part will have all of the pressurization regulators that we normally see at the top of most other cryogenic rocket tanks. The question is, is this a Pathfinder stage that will be used for cryo testing, wet rest rehearsals and static fires at the launch pad, or is this actual flight hardware? With the door open, we also got a peek inside the factory floor, where we can see part of a New Glenn landing leg deployed in a vertical position. New Glenn will feature six landing legs, which tuck into the engine skirt during launch. Also visible are what appears to be segments for an engine skirt. The engine skirt features an internal hexagonal layout that lines up with the shape seen on the segments by the door. In fact, this square cutout may be for a quick disconnect port or some sort of access panel for the engine section. Given how early in production that section is, it may very well be not for this booster tank section, but perhaps for one a bit later down the line. That's nice to know and will bode well for the potential future launch cadence of New Glenn. And speaking of launch cadence for New Glenn, I guess it's really time to head over to Launch Complex 36. There are more signs that Blue Origin is continuing to move ahead with preparations to support the first flight hardware arriving at the pad. After being on the launch mount for the past few months, the Mini TE is now back by the hangar, leaving the pad empty. In this image, we can clearly see the two cutouts at the bottom of the Mini TE. These help support the idea that the TE will support New Glenn's second stages for testing on the main launch pad. The two holes in the base of the structure allow for the upper stage to perform static fires. This also means that we should have great views via our Space Coast Live cameras once Blue begins testing stages on the launch pad. Our own Stephen Marr also captured a New Glenn payload fairing vertical at the launch pad last week. The next day on Space Coast Live, we saw the fairing roll inside of the hangar. With both stage simulators and the payload fairing inside of the hangar at LC-36, it could be possible that Blue are aiming to integrate a full stack simulator on the main transport director and maybe even roll it out to the pad. It also appears that works on the way at the mound up the ramp with some cranes in the area, so definitely some interesting activity going on here. At the northern end of the pad, there has been some land clearing activity where we have seen Blue test both a New Glenn upper stage as well as two Jarvis tanks. It's possible this may all be part of constructing a more permanent testing area for the test tanks. Moving over to the west to the tents where the two previous Jarvis test tanks are being stored, we can see some nice shiny domes and barrel sections for future test tanks of Blue Origin's reusable upper stage development program. At the launch and landing facility, we can check in on Amazon's payload processing facility for their Kuiper Internet Satellite Constellation. Since our last flight, the structure of the large building has continued to grow to the west and now appears to be mainly complete with the crew now adding more roofing as well as walls and even internal floors. There are also several bridge cranes on the site awaiting installation inside of the building. Just before our flight, Space Florida tweeted about this facility and included two drone images showing work underway. 
one of the payload processing facility itself and another showing work on drainage systems being put into place as well as a view looking up the utility corridor to the north where more industrial expansion will take place over the coming years. At the midfield area alongside the 4.6 km runway there is active construction ongoing which appears to be upgrading the crossing between the runway and the midfield side. This area may become an important asset for the future of the Launch Atlantic facility as the industry's presence grows. At Relativity's Launch Complex 16, upgrades to support the company's next generation launch vehicle Terran R are underway. There are large amounts of earthwork going around the site as well as the visible removal of the lightning protection system towers at Terran 1's launch pad. Last month Relativity shared a tweet stating quote, work is underway for land clearing of Terran R's new propellant farm and future launch pad. Updated permits also show a slight reconfiguration to the future layout of Launch Complex 16 which now proposes a water tower, adjusted tank farm layout and more retention ponds. At Launch Complex 39B, the Space Launch System Mobile Launcher 1 is still out there undergoing testing as the Exploration Ground Systems program prepares for Artemis 2. This mobile launcher should roll back to the vehicle assembly building sometime in the next few months to support stacking of the SLS for that mission. Speaking of mobile launchers at the pad, the mobile launch platform for ULA's Atlas V rocket is at Space Launch Complex 41. Something interesting considering the next launch from this complex won't be an Atlas, but rather a Vulcan rocket. The first Vulcan rocket is already stacked inside of ULA's vertical integration facility and soon to roll out for a pre-launch wet dress rehearsal. I'm sure you have heard the news by now. Vulcan's first launch is targeting December 24th at 1.49 am eastern time, which means that perhaps by the time of our next flyover, the empty mobile launch platform we see at the pad will be the one for Vulcan. Now I'm sure you're all wondering what's going on at SpaceX own launch pads. So I will hand it over to Sawyer for a quick overview of what's been going on. It definitely has been quite a busy time for SpaceX at Space Launch Complex 40 and not only because it's the most active launch pad in the world. The crew access tower for this launch pad has now finally been completed. Well, at least the main structure. And we also now have a crew access arm installed as well. We're not fully sure what other system SpaceX may install. One could think maybe a pad escape system of sorts will be installed here, but we can't really know unless SpaceX says so directly. We do see on these flyover pictures a lot of activity near the tower with small cranes and lifts, so perhaps there's still some more work to do before making this tower fully operational. NASA has already indicated that the Axiom 3 mission in no earlier than January of next year could potentially be the first to use this tower for a crew launch, so if that's the case, we're not that far away in time from seeing it supporting a crew mission. We could also see the Falcon 9 for the Starlink Group 6-30 mission. Since our last flyover, SpaceX has launched 10 times, and with that Falcon 9 you see right there, that's the 11th. Moving over to Launch Complex 39A, SpaceX has undergone work to prepare the Transporter Erector for the next launch from here, which is the USSF-52 mission. That mission will be another Falcon Heavy flight, in fact, the fifth of the year, launching the US Space Force's X-37B space plane. While we don't know where the X-37B will go and why it needs a Falcon Heavy, we do know where those side boosters will end. They'll be landing back at LZ-1 and LZ-2, which were looking very nice and ready for their next use in the next few weeks. But that's not all we saw regarding SpaceX's recovery operations, we also flew over Port Canaveral and spotted SpaceX's drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas. This drone ship had delivered booster 1067, and it was being ready to head out for the next Starlink mission, Starlink Group 6-31. The booster, on the other hand, was having its legs retracted while sitting on its booster processing stand. This booster will be turned horizontal and then sent to Hangar X for refurbishment, just like we saw with B-1069. But just like with launch pads, Recovery of reusable boosters won't be a thing that only SpaceX does. Since our last flyover, Blue Origin has brought here to the port a giant crane that we believe will be used to unload new Glenn boosters from their landing barges after they arrive here. This crane, branded in the company's favorite colors, has also been used to unload a new big structure coming from Louisiana. The structure appears to have a central cutout of roughly 8.5 meters in diameter, 
and the handrails have a suspicious hexagonal shape like that of, say, New Glenn's engine section. This kinda looks like some sort of booster stand for New Glenn, basically where the booster would be lifted onto after being removed from its landing barge. It also seems to have a top and a bottom deck with stairs, so this could be for access to the engine section in order to check out the booster and prepare it for transport back to the hangar. Now I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Here at NSF, we've been guessing and trying to see who gets closest to the actual launch dates of both New Glenn and Florida Starship launches. So what's your best guess on when we see these behemoths launch from the Cape? Let us know in the comments down below. As always, thanks for watching and hope to see you back on our next Cape flyover. I'm Sawyer Rosenstein for NSF, and until the next one, Later, nerds.